everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. This is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about plants. Topic for the day is going to be specific plant hormones. So let me get you your objectives and we will get going. By the end of this video, I'll be able to do the following. Describe experiments that led to the discovery of plant hormones and explain the role and actions of each of the major plant hormones. So that's where we're going. Before we get there, um, the new AP Bio curriculum says that you don't need to have specific plant hormones memorized. That being said, they always like specific examples of things. So I would stick a few of these back in your head to reference later on. Before we start talking about different plant hormones, though, let's talk about the experiments that led to the discovery of plant hormones. So there were several people back in the 1800s that started working on figuring out why plants bend towards light when they are you know, growing next to a window or something like that. And there were some experiments that were performed to carry this out. So first experiments were to figure out where the signal is coming from to cause plants to grow towards the light. So one experimenter cut the top off of a grass shoe. Wow, backwards pen, sorry. Um, cut the top off of a grass shoe. And he did two separate experiments. One, he put agar in between the tip and the stem, and the other he put mica, which is like a mineral. And he found that when exposed to light, the one that had agar on it tended to curve towards the light. The one that had mica in between showed no curving response. So from this experiment, he concluded that whatever chemical was causing the plant to bend was being produced from the tip and traveling downward through the stem. Next set of uh, experiments tried to figure out what the chemical is and how it worked. So this time around what they did is they took the tip and cut it off of the grass. They exposed that tip to light because they knew that whatever chemical they were dealing with was coming from the tip. They then took that tip and set it on some agar and let the hormones they later found, their hormones, um, diffuse from the tip into the agar. They then, then took that agar, leaving the tip off of the grass, and put that agar block on top of the stem. They found that the stem would bend away from whatever side the block was put on. So if the block was put on the right hand side and all those chemicals and hormones flowed down the right side of the plant, then the plant was bending towards the left and such was the opposite situation. So they eventually found that the hormone that was traveling down one side of the plant was causing an unequal lengthening and elongation of the cells. The hormone, let's say if it traveled down the right side, would cause the cells on the right side to elongate more fully than those on the left side, which would cause the whole root to bend in this direction. And thus led to the discovery of plant growth regulators or plant hormones. The names are interchangeable with one another, but that's basically how it all worked out. So let's talk about some specifics and that will be the day. First one we talk about is auxin. Now I will say that auxin is probably one of the most important of the plant hormones. It works in conjunction with many other hormones to get stuff done. Um, the experiments I just talked about, those were dealing with auxin. It was the first of the plant hormones um, discovered and it plays the following roles or some of the major roles. Um, first one is elongation. So as we saw in the last example, auxin is a hormone that travels one way down a plant. So make sure that you know that um, auxin always travels down from the bottom of a cell. Okay, so wherever the bottom of the cell is, that is the direction that auxin will travel. So if you've got a plant that's upright, it's going to travel this way. Experimenters found that auxin is expressed in a polar manner, which means that it flows out of one end of the cell. Um, auxin is also responsible for pattern formation in plants, so it controls where leaves will grow, where stems will grow, whether the plant is going to be bushy or whether the stems are just going to lengthen, and it is used in greenhouses to cause the tomatoes to form more fully. Um, within a greenhouse setting, tomatoes don't necessarily fully develop, but when sprayed with auxin, they have been shown to develop into fully functioning, mostly delicious vegetables, fruit, sorry, tomatoes are fruit. Anyway, so that is auxin. Note that it is, works in conjunction with a bunch of other plant hormones um, to ensure the growth of a plant. Next up on the hit list is the cytokinin. Now where auxin causes cells to get 
bigger, it causes elongation, it doesn't cause them to divide. Cytokinin causes division in cells. So cytokinin is usually found towards the ends of buds of the plants where growth is actually happening and is usually found in the roots. Now, where auxin travels from the tip of the plant downwards, cytokinin generally travels from the roots upwards. It flows in the opposite direction and it is, like I said, responsible for cell division it's also responsible for anti-aging. So if a plant cutting is, say, removed from the plant and then dipped in cytokinin, it will last a lot longer than just a cutting that was not dipped in cytokinin. So that would be cytokinin. And next on the list, I'm just going to go ahead and blast through these so that you got them all. Gibrelin. Gibrelin is the last of kind of our growth hormones. Um, it is also responsible for stem elongation. So cytokinin, auxin, gibrelin, they all work together to cause our stems to grow longer and to make the fruit grow bigger. Their special thing is they cause seeds to germinate or they control seed germination. So after a seed's been in the soil for water for a while, it takes in water. And once it's taken in that water, gibrelin is activated, which causes the seed to break dormancy and go ahead and start growing. So gibrelin is the thing that tells the sleeping seed, time to wake up, let's get going. Now, the next hormone works against the ones that we just talked about, and it is called ab abscisic acid, otherwise known as ABA, and it basically does the opposite of all of these ones that we have just talked about. It is a stress hormone. So in stressful situations, it has several actions. First one is it slows growth. So if it would benefit a plant to grow more slowly at a given time, ABA will function to slow down the growth of the plant. Um, usually the growth of a plant can be determined or predicted by the ratio of hormones in relation to ABA. Okay, if there's more ABA, the plant is probably going to grow more slowly. If there's more of the other hormones, cytokinin, oxygen, gibrelin, the plant's probably going to grow more quickly. Um, it also controls seed dormancy in the opposite manner of gibrelin, where gibrelin makes a seed break dormancy and germinate. ABA keeps a seed dormant. So this is what keeps seeds from germinating until the spring or when the conditions are right. It keeps them from seeds germinating inside of a fruit. So that is ABA. It also works on drought tolerance. So if a plant starts to wilt, ABA causes the stomata to close, which slows the water loss of that plant. Last hormone to talk about today is ethylene. Ethylene has several major functions. It's a big one. And ethylene is actually a gas that is produced by plants. Um, it's not necessarily a hormone that is transported, that is made in one part of the cell and transported to another, or made in one part of the plant and transported to another part. Ethylene is a gas that is produced. So first thing it does is it functions in the triple response. And what this is, is let's say we have got our seed, it's germinated, and it is sending out a shoot that's growing up through the soil. If that shoot is growing through the soil and it encounters a rock, ethylene gas is produced, which induces a triple response. The triple response is as follows. The root right here, or the shoot right here, starts to harden and it grows thicker. It also causes the shoot to start to grow horizontally rather than vertically, and then it causes it to turn back in the other direction. So this ethylene gas is responsible for the triple response that allows our shoot to navigate its way up towards the surface of the ground. It is also in control of senescence, which is the killing off of specific cells within the plant. So let's say you've had an annual plant that flowers and then those flowers die and fall off. That would be because of ethylene. You've got leaf abscission, which is the trees dropping their leaves in the fall. So if you can tell, ethylene is kind of like the aging gas or the aging hormone. And the final thing, and this is probably the most commercially important use of ethylene, it controls fruit ripening. As fruit ripens, it produces ethylene gas, which is, causes the fruit around it to further ripen. So the tomato industry, obviously red tomatoes are terrible for shipping because they're soft and they're mashy and you can't put them in a truck. So what tomato industry will do is they will pick tomatoes when they're green and hard, easier to ship. When they get to their destination, they will gas those green tomatoes with ethylene gas, which will cause them to turn bright red. So that is your whirlwind tour of hormones. Like I said, I don't know necessarily that you will need to know everyone in nitty gritty detail, but make sure that you're able to talk about a few of them intelligently. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I hope to see you again. Thank you.